Okay. So, um, typeface design. Um, the world has a lot of fonts, but it always needs more. Um, and so, obviously, you know that the uh, in display advertising, you know, you have like big billboard kind of fonts, um, and there's a kind of infinite demand for for variety there. Um, and within finer typography, then you might have the idea of like a super family that you have a, a very large number of styles that are all related. So typically you would think of, you know, you have regular and bold, um, Roman italic, um, you can have a whole set of weights, and then um, you can have uh, sets of widths, and then you can have other kinds of variations. And so in a very, um, you know, kind of um, what I find a very his funny historical way, the work that was done on Metafont and the, uh, uh, the typography in, in tech, you know, way back in you know, the 70s, um, is, is very ahead of its time. I'm, I'm sure you guys will know this. So this idea of um, having, uh, you know, very subtle variations is something that um, was, was done in, by Don Knuth, and so this is his computer modeling with optical variations. So this kind of um, variation in the typeface is uh, for having actually a different font at different sizes. So it, you wouldn't kind of consciously know that it was a different font, and it would just look better. So for um, to, to step through these three images, the, the top image is um, the type designed for very small sizes, like captions. The middle image is for kind of you know, the body size for reading, and then the bottom one is used for big titles. And so the adjustments that are made to these um, to this type, you can see that the as you get bigger optically, then the thinnest parts of the letters get thinner, and the spacing between the letters gets tighter. And at a small size, if you were to print that optical. Uh, that, that large size of, uh, of design at a small size, then the thin parts would become kind of too thin, the space would become too tight, and so um, yeah, that's that's this idea of optical variation. So this kind of um, technology, you know, having um, size-specific designs, hasn't really caught up in two two thousand and fourteen, um, and um, uh, the the process of designing type big type families is quite laborious. And so I was very interested in ways to um, you know, design and uh, build new type design software to try and make the process of designing big families easier. So I met a, a designer uh, from Zurich, Simon Egley, and he had been working on a project called metaflop.com. And metaflop provides a kind of um, uh, sliders-based interface to Metafont itself, or at least um, Metapost, which is the you know, PostScript version of Metafont. And so this allows you to interactively adjust um, your type design, and you, know, you can play with all of these various sliders and get out different designs. And so the designers, um, you know, who, who, the, the team who worked on this, Simon was the visual designer, and he produced you know, a very simple meta font, which produces all these variations, and then a slightly more visually sophisticated one. And so this is this kind of variation that I started with, you know, that these look like completely different fonts, um, and yet they have a kind of common structure, and um, the way that they vary you know, is, is, uh, yeah, is based on this kind of skeleton idea, that, that it's this, the styling of the letter strokes, which is changing, and the, the structure is the same. So um, the process of, um, of, of working with Metaflop was the same process that you know, uh, Don Knuth was working with in the 70s, where you would kind of sketch out some ideas, and then you would write code. And you could then play with the parameters uh, on the web, but it was still very much you know, a, a process of programming a font. And that's very alien. Not a lot of type designers are, are going to do that. So, um, discussing with Simon uh, when I met up with him, you know, I said I really felt like we needed a way to turn existing type designs, which were drawn, into skeleton fonts and control them. 
know, that you could uh, take an existing design and somehow convert it into a metaphont and then get the power of parametric type design. So um, Simon said that he had an idea about how to do that, that you could take control points and turn them into pen strokes. So what, what I mean by pen stroke is that um, you have a, a kind of skeleton line you know, for, the, for the stroke, for the direction, and then you have a kind of offset from that for the port and starboard sides, and then that can produce these you know, extremely calligraphic shapes that we you know, easily recognize uh, in letter forms. And so um, uh, this idea of taking a drawn shape and inferring a skeleton point requires you to draw with pairs of points, but that's a fairly easy requirement. You know, a lot of, a lot of um, the time when you're drawing a, a, with, a, with regular Bezier tools, you would tend to do that anyway, because you know, you're trying to mimic the stroke of a pen, and so you have these pairs of points together. So if you always do that, um, then you can infer a skeleton point, and then you can start marking that up with uh, the uh, metaphont uh, parameters, and you can re recreate the same shape that you were drawn. And you can mix and match these, so you could uh, you know, only apply this to a section, um, and you have your skeleton point inferred from the left and right ones, and then you can start to you know, change those parameters to um, you know, really vary the font. Now this is obviously going to um, you know, distort the shapes, um, but the, um, the hobby spline, which is in the metaphor, is kind of interpolating the spline, and so it, it does reduce the amount of distortion. Um, the, uh, with, a, with a regular Bezier spline, then you end up with you know, these things, these kinds of distortions where this has become very thin as it has been um, stretched up. But with a hobby spline, you, you keep more of the original proportions. And um, this idea of a pen stroke could be very limiting. You, know, you could say, well, this is a nice circle, but what if you wanted the inner edge to be different to the outer edge? Um, well, the, the idea of, 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 of having that control, I think, is, is also not, um, that's not a problem. You don't have to stick to a symmetrical stroke. So um, the, the next problem then is that you, you know, you're dealing with the inside letter form uh, changes, but you also want to be able to control a typeface um, at a kind of global level. You want to say take all of the letters and, and stretch them up. And so this is this kind of Pinocchi idea, you know, of turning a, a font into a kind of marionette. Um, and uh, to do that, you need to name the parts. So the things that you can name, you can control. And of course, we have lots of names for the parts of letters. So the, the kind of process that Simon and I had been discussing was that you could sketch, you know, sketch a design, you could draw it in the regular familiar way that you're used to, and then convert it into these kind of skeleton points, tag them up with metaform parameters, and then you could start to you know, really create a lot of variations of your type very fast. Um, and uh, this kind of you know, massive uh, multiplication of the designs then becomes a, a challenge. So the way that type designers um, have traditionally made type families is with plain linear interpolation. Um, and so we thought that we could use that idea to try and manage the complexity of having dozens and dozens of, of, of font styles in a meta family. And so um, uh, this idea of interpolation, you know, where you're, you're traveling between um, two different designs, um, would, let me see. Yeah, so, so this idea of interpolation would help to kind of manage the complexity. So you would start out with your original um, drawing, and then you would you know, turn it into um, a, a different visual style. And then you could kind of pin that as a new interpolation master. And then um, you could take the original in a different direction, and you'd end up with this kind of yeah, multiplying set of styles that would be interpolatable. So um, the regular type designers, you know, think about their interpolations in this uh, kind of idea of like a design space. So um, this is uh, called the Nord's Eye Cube, and it's uh, a you know 
variation in three dimensions where you're um, varying in weight, um, uh, the amount of contrast, and the angle of contrast. And so these are some of the kind of most fundamental ways that uh, the letter strokes can vary. So this ability to set up your own design spaces um, we thought was, you know, was important. So having kind of talked about that, uh, we uh, wrote some kind of basic software to, um, uh, to, to, to see if we could uh, see if this theor theoretical idea would work. So Simon wrote some um, uh, kind of basic Python, which would take um, a drawn letter form and parse it into a meta form and then take the, um, the output of uh, meta post and parse that into um, uh, Bezier vector points that you could render on the web. And so um, he you know, made some kind of basic designs for this, and he made a prototype. And I'd like to show you the prototype, but uh, it's broken at the moment. <laughs> Fortunately, though, um, I, we have this step-by-step -step document that explains exactly how the prototype worked. So you took you know, a drawing made in an existing font editor, and then you loaded the program and you imported it. And you, you got this very kind of peculiar result where everything was very curvy. And that's because um, the, uh, you know, the, the MetaPost engine will just assume that everything is um, curvy and set things up automatically at the curved directions. So you then kind of override those basic defaults to then you know, set this direction um, in this way. And as a prototype, you know, it was very hand a very hand, hand working laborious process. Um, but you ended up with you know, the shape that you had, uh, had started with. And we figured that you know, we'd, be able to, we'd be able to automate that. Um, so then you, uh, you, you get a, a way of setting these parameters for points selected. And a you know, way to kind of you know, hit this green button and stamp your, your different variations. And then um, you'd be able to interpolate between these interpolations with a big slider at the top. And so this, this basic prototype you know, was working uh, very well. Um, and Simon was able to achieve the kinds of variations that we had been discussing. But the problem with this system was that it was, uh, yeah, it was very kind of slow to use. Um, so we, we kind of started redoing things. But with the prototype that we had, we could you know, start to talk to write other designers and see you know, what they thought. So we did a kind of Pepsi challenge where we took an existing drawn font, we put it through the system, and then we asked people to you know, say which was better, a kind of blind test. And so there are some you know, extremely um, small variations in the outlines. Uh, we couldn't you know, create it 100%. But people, a few people actually said they preferred the machine version, that it was kind of more consistent and um, so I was, we were, I was very happy with that. So this idea of um, you know, affecting the outlines um, creates distortions and that stretching the skeleton um, uh, can produce a, a nicer effect. So we took a uh, free software from EV Garamond and um, put that through the system. And so um, this is you know, this is kind of taking the A and stretching it as a skeleton rather than an affine transformation. Um, and we took EB Gamma and kind of pared it down to its kind of essential sans um, you know, monolinear strokes. And so Simon called this design Sean. Um, and yeah, I think that you know the, the fundamental forms in Gamma are so familiar to us that by kind of boiling it down the result was, was very pleasing. And um, yeah, the, the kind of, this kind of weight variation, um, you can see that there's, um, there's like a dozen different weights here. And so this to me was, uh, you know, was very exciting that you could really harness the power of Metaphon through, from a, a set of drawn outlines. Uh, another example was um, you know, very simple. We took the um, uh, the font EXO and um, very simply you know, reduced all of the curves in it to straight lines to create a kind of woodcut looking design. And uh, when we went in contact with the original designer of this uh, free software font and said like, this is what we did, he was, he was very happy as well. Um, 
and he was you know, he was going to release this uh, you know as part of his uh, kind of family. And then um, the the final prototype book that Simon did was um, some custom type identity type for a company because he's a he's a working does graphic designer, and so he was able to um, you know design his family very consistently, and then when they wanted changes. Um, you know, he was able to do that faster than he would have with traditional tools. So um, at that point, we um, uh, decided to uh, kind of rethink the, the technical basis of what we were doing because we wanted to have this kind of rich interactivity on the web. So um, uh, we found there was a library for reading and writing open type fonts directly in the browser that allowed you to um, interpolate two fonts. So um, straight in the browser, you could have some uh, sliders for changing things. And we figured that we could then kind of feed those parameters that we decided on the kind of web preview back into the Metafont system. So you could have that live interactivity um, and use Metafont to you know, actually kind of process the, the parameters. Um, but what we what we found is that that was very slow, so we were um, we were concerned also about you know the, the accuracy of, of of doing this. That if we make this kind of stretch here, this is just a plain interpolation. Um, but we figured it would be you know, better to be able to to really be able to uh, adjust you know the points to control the distortion directly in the browser. Um, so we looked at. Um, compiling MetaPost as into JavaScript, um, but that was quite of a technical challenge, and we weren't able to to complete that that work in the time that we tried to do it. Um, I, I still think that you know it's theoretically possible um, to run MetaPost directly in the browser, um, and there is a there's a techlive.js project you know, which has done it for regular tech. Um, so we, we kind of stepped back from that and thought, what are we really using? Well, really, the, the core of what we're doing is the, the hobby spline. Um, so uh, we looked at re-implementing that. So Simon made a, a version of the hobby spline for the RoboFont proprietary font editor. Um, and so that allows you to you know, change the tension of the curves um, directly in, in his regular font editor. Um, and then we started working on a 100% JavaScript-based um, system. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we've also been um, working with a user experience designer to try and really kind of make the user interface really useful for people. Um, since Simon's interface was, you, you kind of had to have read the tech book, know a lot of uh, Metafont parameters off the top of your head to really make use of it. So that's all being documented on the wiki. Um, and the, uh, the the team there are you know, kind of re trying to rethink things from scratch in a way. So um, uh, the the current kind of brainstorming on the wiki has been looking at different ways of providing user interfaces to interpolation, um, and uh, yeah, we have a, a demo of the. Uh, the, the current JavaScript, 100% JavaScript based system. I'm sorry, I think the video is kind of cut off, like it was being cropped. Sorry, guys. Okay.
So um, we, uh, as part of the as part of the um, the JavaScript rewrite, then uh, Lance Fister uh, is a, a designer developer who, who kind of got involved in the project, and he had this idea that you could um, you you would need some kind of cascading system for describing exceptions to the parameters. That if you set a kind of global parameter for the whole font, then there are some glyphs where maybe you would want to make exceptions to that. And then within the glyph, you would maybe want to make exceptions on a point by point basis. And so um, he felt that the familiar syntax of CSS from web design would be uh, a good way to do that. And so he's, he's written a, um, a CPS system for setting these metafont parameters or these metafont like parameters. Um, and so that's what you can see here on the left. And then on the right, you have a um, HTML5 canvas <coughs> rendering of the glyphs. And uh, this web interface is built with um, Google's Angular JS, and so this kind of you know ability to move this slider and have everything uh, update together is this kind of standard Angular JS stuff. And so here we can see Lars is adjusting some of the parameter values in the text file, and then when he clicks that update preview button, then it re-renders it, um, and that process of um, in the same way that the slider can change all of the sizes of the preview areas, then we can bind this text file to the rendering so that it can be you know, absolutely real time. So um, uh, Lars has published this code um, on GitHub. Uh, he, we haven't set up it up on the homepage uh, just yet. We're kind of trying to do that for the conference, but we didn't get there. So um, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. It's 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 github.com slash metabolator. Um, so yeah, that's that's where the project's at today, um, and um, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's there's a package called mf2pt1, and um, that does what I think you want. And so the um, the kind of set, you know, the first version um, of Metapolator was using that. It was it was pretty kind of crazy because it was just a prototype. And so um, uh, let me see, what is that? Well, that was type one, not, not open type, right? Well, okay, so so. <clears throat> Similar to the previous talk, this is kind of a history of Silicon Valley kind of thing. Um, so Adobe made the uh, PostScript system with Type One and Type Three fonts. So Type Three fonts are full PostScript, the full PostScript programming environment is available for, for drawing glyphs. And Type One is a um, uh, encapsulated style, so it's not a full Turing complete programming environment. But the you you also get hinting. And Adobe had structured its business so that Type 1 was originally a proprietary format and Type 3 was publicly documented. And so only they could make high quality hinted fonts. Um, and then when my Apple and Microsoft produced a true type format, then Adobe published the specs to Type 1. And then the Cold War ended and Silicon Valley's well, went after the global market. And so all three of Apple and Adobe and Microsoft started making their own. Uh, worldwide global font formats, and then App, Adobe and Microsoft teamed up to produce OpenType, and Adobe's contribution was to kind of wedge Type 1 fonts into the TrueType format, uh, plus the um, character shaping which Microsoft had developed as TrueType Open, and that became OpenType. And so, 
type one postscript fonts are you know, can, can very easily become open type CFF fonts. Um, and so MF2PT1 produces a postscript type one font from your metafont, or at least a subset of metafont because metapost doesn't support 100% of the metafont language. And so you can then use FontForge to convert that type one font into an open type CFF font. And the shaping, uh, you know, the international language um, aspect of open type is somewhat orthogonal. So with FontForge, you can have a, you know, you have a standard glyph set, and then you can put that into uh, a meta font and change the shapes, get the same glyph set out, and then you combine the glyph set with the open type features file again you know, using FontForge, and then you have a, uh, you have, um, the same language support and functionality of the original with different shapes. And so that's the prototype that we built and then we threw away. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do now? I mean, are you support the same functionality? Um, so um, there's a, a font source format called UFO. And UFO is a, the... Oh God, what am I doing? So, so UFO is an XML serialization of the RoboFab Python object model. And so um, RoboFab is this yeah, Python library for working on font sources, and UFO is its serialization. And so that UFO is just XML. It makes it very easy to make new font editors because you just have the standard um, XML uh, uh, schema. And then um, FontForge or other proprietary font compilers can compile UFO to OpenType CMS. Yeah, yeah, because there are from somewhere over 20,000 text fonts and display fonts in the market, but there's fewer than 10, more like a number like five, that have an adequate repertoire of math characters. Do you have any plans to tackle uh, math characters along with regular characters? Because for a lot of people in the technical community, it would be wonderful just to have a wider choice of Fonts that went with the match fonts. <laughs> yeah, um, so um, uh, I mean, I haven't really talked about like myself or my background, what I'm doing. Um, I spent the last kind of eight years working on free software fonts because I wanted to democratize the typography. Um, most of the world uh, have even less fonts than the mathematical community. Um, and um, so the, um, there's a uh, a wiki book project that I uh, was involved in, which is like a type design manual. So if you want to learn how to do type design, you can do it with only free software. Um, and um, the the it's it's funny, kind of funny to say the mathematics community is a minority community, um, but that's, I mean it was kind of in a way how I would see it. And so my answer, uh, you know, for you is the same as I would give to someone in Sri Lanka who's upset that there's not very many Sinhalese ones, which is that you have to learn to do it yourself. <laughs> but we're not type designers. We're going to grow up to be type designers. Yeah, everyone, everyone can have the dream job. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much. All right.